welcome you all here. We are pleased to have five very smart people join us to make sense uh, of this very peculiar year. No doubt you have your own adjective. <coughs> and certainly our panelists will as well. Uh, the purpose today is to deepen our thinking about this year by hearing their thinking uh, about it. If there was ever a period to have an informed and considered opinion towards, it's 2008. We knew going into it there would be a new president, but who could have predicted the other major storyline, namely our economic meltdown? I guess Michael Kinsley could. Did you raise your hand on that? Well, half. Half, okay. <laughs> so here we have five people to make sense of it all, and I am pleased to introduce in uh, order of closest to me, Mike Kinsley. He is a longtime editor and columnist, most recently with Time Magazine. He became one of us, a Washingtonian that is, back in the mid-90s when he moved here to launch Slate.com, a small startup within Microsoft. If you enjoy his columns, uh, you're bound to enjoy his books as well. In 19, 2008, rather, saw the publication of two, last spring a collection of his columns, and most recently, just a month or two ago, he published Creative Capitalism, a work he edited that includes some of the leading economic thinkers of our time on just how and whether our economic system ought to reinvent itself. I believe Mike's book is for sale out in the lobby. So, if you like what he says, you have a chance to buy what he says. Next up, Norm Rice. We are pleased he's here. He was the mayor of this great city uh, for two terms back in the 90s. In that role, he, he gained quite a national following, including having served as a time, a time rather, uh, in, the, in the position of president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. After leaving City Hall, Rice spent six years as CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank here in Seattle. And of late, he can be found on the UW campus, where he teaches at the Evans School of Public Affairs. Sam Reed is here. He was just elected to his third term as Washington's Secretary of State. It has been a big year for him. He led the move to our top two primary system that is, for now, the way of doing things. He also oversaw the largest general election turnout in state history for the first time over three million ballots cast in Washington. And it was the first gubernatorial election since, of course, that controversial contest of 2004. Mm -hmm. Reed has spent much of his time since then trying to work out the problems in the system so that they did not recur, and thankfully there is no sign that they did. Finally, uh, not finally rather, but next up is, well, I'll, I'll get to Bruce, sorry. Uh, Bruce, we welcome Bruce. He is the chairman and CEO of Home Street Bank, which has served our community, forget this, nearly 90 years. One of the largest privately owned banks in the Northwest, and Williams is, believe it or not, the third generation of his family to lead the institution. He follows his father and his grandfather before him. Before joining the bank in 1990 as general counsel, Bruce served as an attorney with Perkins Coie. And finally, fresh from the auto bailout in DC that was a bust, <laughs> Patty Murray, our senior U.S. Senator, it's hard to imagine another Washingtonian that is any closer to the unprecedented action that has been taking place at the federal level to stabilize our, our economy. She is conference secretary of her party in the Senate, which means she serves as one of the top four Democrats in that body. She is also chair of the Transportation Appropriation Subcommittee, which needless to say has been quite helpful to us in Washington State. Please give them a round of applause. Starting with Mike and moving down the panel, your one or two most defining moments of the year. And let me pull this mic closer to you. Well, that, that's pretty easy. One was the election of Barack Obama's president, and the other, you'd have to pick something from the financial crisis, and I would pick um, yesterday or the day before when U.S. Treasuries were available if you could get them with zero interest. <laughs> Norm Rice. 
Clear, Top two defining moments. Clearly, the election of Barack Obama, and uh, tangential to that, the extraordinary uh, uh, out of young people uh, getting involved in the political process, not only just on the internet, but also volunteering and working uh, in states all, all across this nation. Sam Reed. I was in this hotel room in Yakima, Washington last March, and I noticed there's a voice, when I picked it up, said, congratulations, Sam, click. <laughs> Pretty soon an AP reporter called me and says, well, congratulations, Sam. And I said, well, thank you. Uh, but what are you congratulating me for? And he said, the top two primary ruled by the US Supreme Court, 7-2 decision. And I said, wow, and uh, as what the AP story. <laughs> Second was just what a wonderful job all 39 counties did in this election after all the changes in scrutiny and everything. It, it was really a great year for the elections process as well as Norm said for the participation of people of all ages. Bruce, your top two moments. Um, like Mike said, the, the economy is a whole series of A little bit closer to the microphone. The economy and the whole series of moments and what's um, particularly striking about that is you know, it wasn't a natural disaster. It wasn't like an earthquake. It was entirely um, unnecessary, and it's been such a disaster for our country. Um, hopefully, the election of Barack Obama will turn out to be a meaningful moment as well. Patty Murray. Well, I think the two defining moments for me, other than flying here this morning and actually having the plane get on time. <laughs> she was on an 8 a.m. flight our time to no. get here. Give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> oh, that would be 5 a.m. your time. 5 a.m. our time, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, the election, obviously, but it was a moment of the election that was defining for me when I was uh, out campaigning um, days before the election and so many people were turning out. We were up at Western Washington University and uh, arrived to a student union building that was so crammed with students, there were several thousand who were so excited about the election a few days later uh, that were, was coming a few days later and just the meaning of this election really struck me that people were excited and enthusiastic and a new generation was really taking charge of their country it was a very defining moment for me within that election and I think the other defining moment for me also had to do with the economy we have been watching it struggle for some time uh, clearly we did a surplus sending you all some of you all a few checks almost a year ago uh, trying to deal with all of this we'd heard about AIG and Lehman Brothers and I was called to a leadership meeting on a Thursday night in the middle of September uh, about I mean about seven o'clock at night uh, some member of leadership where the eight uh, leaders of the Senate Democrat and Republican met with the eight leaders of the House we were told to be there as soon as we could uh, and Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke were there and we sat around a table and within two minutes after we sat down they said to us we are here to ask you for a 700 billion dollar bailout and uh, th you know these are leaders of the country sitting at that table and the looks on all of our faces were you you've got to be kidding and I think that was a defining moment for me because I realized the depth and breadth of the economy and the economic impacts and the political uh, course that we had to now define whether we were going to give that to them or not, what, what it would mean for the economy. And here we are now, several months later, we have a new president and the economy is struggling and we are going to have to deal with both of them. It's a very defining time for all of us. So back by popular demand is this question. What did you change your mind about this year? Michael Kinsley. Yeah. <laughs> do, do I have to start? Um, well, I've changed my mind about the auto bailout about half a dozen times. <laughs> Just in the past couple of weeks, I was most influenced by a, a, a review, actually, of a car in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago, which began something like, in all my years of reviewing automobiles, I have never been asked to review anything as absurd as the Cadillac Escalante um, <laughs> hybrid. And, and he went on in that vein, and at that point I decided that they didn't deserve it. But I've changed my mind two or three times just since then. Well, where, where are you at today? Today, well, you know, 
Um, I'm sort of a partisan guy, so when I heard that the Republicans <laughs> were killing it, I sort of thought I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, Norm Rice, what'd you change your mind about? I can't follow that. Yeah. I, <laughs> believe it or not, I haven't changed my mind. Uh, uh, I, I, well, there must be something. No, I, I, what I see and what I feel and where I think we are going, I feel quite positive, and I haven't changed that view. I, I, it's an extraordinary challenge, but I do think that these uh, changes that we see before us are investments, and I look at them as investments rather than the bailouts, and that if we don't make these investments now, we'll be in a mel of a hess. So it's going forward. Sam Reed. Well, I bet like many people in the room, uh, the first time they talk, started talking about bailing out people who had bought homes with no money down and they really didn't have, you know, and I thought, oh, brother, you know, are we really going to do this? Uh, and then obviously, and I think Senator Murray stated it well, all of a sudden you begin grasping just how significant this is and what the ramifications are, and I changed my mind. I think for me it's just the, the change in expectations for the economy. It was right about a year ago when I went from thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of a problem, to thinking this is going to be a really big problem. Penny Murray? Uh, it was easily the bailout. When we first heard that, I said, no way, there's no, no way I will vote for this. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, sitting there for two hours listening to Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke outline for us the consequences of the na nation not stepping up to the plate at this very difficult time. Uh, and uh, knowing the political consequences of that vote, as difficult as it was, I changed my mind and did vote for it. And another sort of round that will go down on, starting with Mike again, you have, you have the um, privilege of going first in all these, but we'll start at Patty's end at some point here. <laughs> but you again, what didn't you see coming this year? And economic meltdown is unfair. Um, I, I will have to wait and think. Anyone didn't see something coming? Well, I, I think I have to say that as much as I was a supporter of Barack Obama, I still was surprised, <laughs> needless to say, uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, the vote and uh, by the uh, reach that he had all throughout the nation. I, I think no one thought that an African American would be elected uh, uh, president in the, in the near future. And this was extraordinary. And, uh, uh, you wanted it. You wanted to see it coming, but your expectations, I, I kind of lowered them because it just hadn't happened. Yeah. Anyone else on that? Uh, I, I would have to say, since it's awfully fresh in my mind, I did not see the, this us reaching the point last night where as much as we are bailout weary and as much as all of us have had a car that we're mad about, to see the United States Senate last night stop the uh, manufacturing auto uh, bailout from happening and knowing the consequences that are now upon us. Okay, let me just get into some of the economy questions. This bailout pattern, Patty Murray, when does it end? <laughs> well, I, I will say this, we have to, to make some very positive steps to get our economy moving back again. And certainly I see the new administration, the Obama administration, the transition team working very rapidly as we speak today to put in place a stimulus package to get people back to work, which is really the basics of what we need to be doing so people feel confident about the economy again. I was uh, at a forum about a week and a half ago in Everett talking to people about the economy and uh, and a gentleman stood up in the audience and told me that he had a really great idea about a small business. He wanted to get started. He wanted to know what he needed to do and could I help him? And I said, well, what are the obstacles you face? He stopped and he said, fear. And that to me uh, was really, I think, what is happening in our country that we have got to get past. We need to be confident again. We need to get the economy moving again uh, so that, um, that people have jobs, feel confident, and we're back did on you our feet. Did you expect another big industry, aerospace, to be coming to Washington, just to throw out? Uh, I think if we do not do a stimulus job that gets this economy back to work, that puts people to work in uh, construction, in building things, and in a, uh, working to a green environment, that yes, we would see more bailouts. I think it's that critical. 
Bruce, let me get you in here. You run this bank that, that dodged the subprime problem. You're still profitable. You're still, I think your home loans are even up this year. How did you, why are you so smart? Uh, <clears throat> Well, that's a good question because for a while there we were thinking, why are we so dumb that we can't <laughs> figure these things out? But, but in, in fairness, I think probably around here and I think around the country, most local banks didn't do the subprime lending. I don't know if I know that for a fact. And how come? Um, I think a couple of reasons. One is that local banks tend to have a, a kind of closer connection between decision making and accountability, and which is the way you know, most things work, but the subprime fiasco came out because this system evolved to separate the two. And mortgage brokers could have made as many loans as they could and get paid for it, and they weren't really responsible for it. And you had people who could sell securities around the world, and they didn't think they were responsible. So this, this chain developed of people who were making a ton of money feeling like they didn't have any accountability. That's what's unusual. It isn't so unusual for local banks to say, well, this, this doesn't make sense for And you. was there any temptation when you saw this gravy train, you know, in 03, 04, 05, to kind of, you know, jump into it. Actually, for us, it was the other way around. It was more of a, you know, if we, it's hard when somebody is selling too good to be true and you're only selling true, it's harder to do that. I um, mean, a lot of, you know, it doesn't sound as good. And, and so for us, really, the challenge was, do you stick with single family lending? Do you stick with home loans? And that was our debate. And we, we thought, you know, sooner or later, we think this is going to go away and we'll try it out last year. I mean, the question was not should we double down and be more aggressive, it's should we actually get out of this because we can't compete with all this craziness. Correct. Correct. But Correct. you chose to stick with it and it's worked. It, it's worked really well. In fact, I mean, in a pretty lousy housing market, um, our volume is up, up this year. So that, that's, that's not, particularly, I don't know if you've been paying attention, rates are about 5% now. It's a great, <laughs> great time to get a mortgage. <laughs> Mike Kinsley, let me get you in on this. How come, I mean, the, the folks on Wall Street probably have some of the highest IQs of anyone. How is it that all these smart people got us into such big problems? Um, well, you know, you could say it was greed. Um, I, I've been puzzling all year, really. Um, how can it be? That, that it's that all the cures for this problem are so pleasant. You know, I, I wrote a piece in January attacking the idea of a stimulus. At that time, they were talking about 150 billion, which seems like nothing. And I said that this was, this was a hair of the dog um, solution. You know, we've been, drunk with debt and we're told the solution is to go out and borrow more money and give it to people and make sure they spend it you know and if they save it they're ruining everything and can it be that easy but um and i still don't know the answer but if these people were so smart Greed should have stopped them from doing this because they would have known that Armageddon was ahead. Well, you know, I'm one of those people who's predicted 12 of the last three recessions. So, <laughs> so you know, to me, it, it's, it's... It was obviously stupid. Yes, <laughs> okay. but, you know, People have been, they've been doing it for years and it always paid off, you know. I think a lot of smart people knew that the music was going to stop and there weren't enough chairs to go around, but they thought that they had another year before that before happened. Before the party was over. Yeah. Norm Rice, what does this mean for our community? How badly will we be hurt? Well, I, I still worry uh, if there isn't a stimulus package at, at, that invests in infrastructure or, or brings those dollars locally, then I think there's still a large amount of problems because uh, every budget in the state, uh, local jurisdictions, is in crisis and are in a cutting mode and it's not going to be good for services that you need to have. The debt that some of the uh, counties and cities have may be in jeopardy as far as paying off the bonds that they have. And uh, so, there, and there are no easy choices. It isn't going to be where you, you gotta cut police, fire, education, the very uh, heart 
heartbeat of what our communities. And so without some infusion of dollars that keeps people working, uh, keeps people in their homes so they can pay their property taxes and pay their taxes, uh, we're going to have real problems. So I, I think it's important that, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it, I think the president-elect will have a package uh, as it relates to investments in cities and metropolitan areas, and I think that's going to have to go forward. I say that because it's really important to do this because if you don't do this, what you're going to have uh, in two or three years is a deficit uh, that is going to be extraordinary. And if you haven't made an investment in human beings and in cities, that deficit uh, looming large without really any kind of value going to communities will be a political liability. Patty, let me get you on this, this stimulus. I mean, if it passes, and the, and the talk is sort of a $500 billion program sometime early in the Obama administration, what can Washington see out of that? Well, I think what everyone is focused on is providing stimulus dollars that put people to work in the immediate. You've heard President-elect Obama talk about shovel-ready projects, and they really do mean that. They don't want to just uh, have money sitting on a shelf that two years from now, when everybody's got their environmental study impacts and engineering and design ready, then there's money for them. They want people to get to work now so they can start paying their mortgages. But they're also looking at it strategically, and we, we don't know yet what it's going to be. But I think they, it's not just paint lines in the middle of a street to put people to work. It is what do we do with that infrastructure that creates a better, solid, uh, stronger economy for tomorrow. But does Washington have enough shovel-ready projects to actually kind it, of make a difference? It is roads, bridges, and highways. There is no doubt about that. But it is also about investing in uh, the basics of health care, uh, the green economy, which we are at the front edge on. It's great for us to be able to do some of that research and development that gets us to uh, the kind of jobs for tomorrow. And as I have been reminding them, uh, we also better be educating people to fill those jobs or we'll just have a lot of infrastructure that doesn't have the capability to be sustained. CR, I believe that Alaska has plans all ready to go yeah. on a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> Sam Reed, it was not a great year to be a Republican, and I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> and yet, you're like the star, you know, you're the star of your party. You and Rob McKenna locally, Riker too, but certainly statewide, you're the two folks. What does your party do to build back strength, both at the state level and at the federal level? Well, unfortunately, the Republican Party uh, in recent years, well, it might even go back a couple of decades, have, have been kind of descending into this narrow mindset in terms of reaching out to all the various elements of, of our society uh, in, in terms of ethnic group, in terms of reaching out more to women voters, to young voters. Uh, and they really need to go back to where we were when I got involved, which was we were very much the party of an, an inclusiveness. Also, we kind of degenerated into how much you can badmouth government. And the reason people elect you to office is to run government and to run it well. And, uh, and, I, and we have done that over the years. We have a proud history here in the state of Washington. Uh, I was pleased uh, with how well Rob McKinnon and I did, and I think it did have something to do with our records in office and the fact we were providing that kind of, of pragmatic and open uh, service to the state. And, uh, and, you know, we actually did pick up a seat in both the House and Senate, so it wasn't a real disaster in this state, uh, but we definitely are the minority party right now, and I think we have a long ways to go to get back to being, you know, even with the Democrats in the state of Washington. Mike, what's your best advice for Republicans? Um, take a year off. Yeah. Yeah. Norm, do you have any advice? I think they have to be a party that says uh, to the public, you can see your face in the people who uh, represent the party. If you can't see your face and you can't see the aspirational goals that come out that are going to appeal to you, then you aren't going to get there. And I think what's happened is there's been such a narrowing and a kind of divisive attitude about politics that rather than the inclusive that it's going to be hard they've really got to be looking at where is the new uh, uh, places where they can, can recruit and get people involved 
I'm hoping that they won't be successful because I'm a Democrat, but I do believe that the uh, biggest challenge right now for the Democrats is can we keep this enthusiasm that we've got and bottle it and use it? And I just go one step further. I really believe that if there is a community engagement and there is a public service component of getting these people involved, such as rehabilitating apartment buildings uh, to, to make them sustainable, uh, improving the housing stock, getting these individuals actually actively involved in building their communities, they'll, they'll, they'll make it. But if you are just going to sit on the sidelines and start saying the bailout won't work or there isn't an investment, there shouldn't be a stimulus package, you're not really uh, really going to help uh, solve that problem. Right? Well, I have actually do have some serious advice for Republicans. It's striking when you move from the East or anywhere in the country to the Pacific Northwest, the theme of libertarianism. You know, leave me alone and let me live my life is just very strong here. And that group is up for grabs, I think. The Republicans, you know, have the social issues where they're completely controlling, if they could, and Democrats haven't really embraced it. So that, and the kids coming out of college have that feeling very strongly, except for the environment. So I think that would be, if I That's was, an opening. Yes, if I was a Republican, that's what I would go after. Patty Murray, when Obama takes office in January, what's going to be the toughest thing for him? Will it be reaching across the aisle and getting Republicans to work with him, or will it be the more progressive side of the Democratic Party that's expecting too much? <laughs> Well, I think right now, because our country really is in a very, very tough spot economically, that he will find that America and Congress, as a reflection of that, is willing to step up and sit down and work together to solve the critical challenge in front of us. And I believe that the first several months as we work through that, he will be able to reach across the aisle, which he has to do, and bring Democrats from the left along with him. I think the question becomes, um, six months from now, uh, you know, if the economy starts to stabilize, and although I would say it's going to take longer than that, but uh, the next step, which is dealing with health care or the environment or other issues, and he continues to do what he is doing right now, which is to be uh, working with everybody and having everybody be a part of the solution, uh, he will have to be, um, continue to do that. Bruce, what more would you do? What more at the Fed level would help your industry bankers, mortgages, all the rest? I think, <clears throat> I think not just helping us, but in, in general, keep, keeping the mortgage rates low, I'm hoping is going to make a difference. The other thing I'd say is, um, you know, as much as I said most local banks didn't do subprime lending, the unfortunate fact is most local banks don't do a lot of home lending at all because the, the system is so stacked against local banks. And I think part of the problem we got into was the the sort of concentration of mortgage lending in a pretty narrow group of large companies um, that I think we'd be better off, particularly in a very large country, if you had a lot more lenders and if we leveled the playing field so that my fellow small bankers would get back into the business, I think we'd be better off. Are you taking some of this TARP money? We, we have applied. We're, we're um, family and employee owned, so we're privately held, and they set it up first for the publicly traded companies, and now they've just come out with it for privately held. So we've applied, although this week they said it's going to take a month to get through all the publicly traded companies. Mike, you're, you're the journalist at the table. Norm spent a time as journalist, <laughs> so he can weigh in on this too. Give us a sense of your thoughts on the coverage of the election. Um, well, I think that uh, conservatives who felt that it was slightly tilted toward Obama have a fair point. Um, it was, it was, well, it was the first election since I've been voting where I was in a swoony mood. And, <laughs> and I think others, others were as well. Do you like the trend, I mean, the trend on MSNBC, which is, more, which is most notable, where they've really gone sort of 
you know, unabashedly left. Is well, that kind of trend something we're going to see more of and a good or bad idea? Actually, I think a possible solution to the crisis of newspapers, which looms very large, possibly larger for me than for everybody else here or most other people here, is toward more overt opinion. And, you know, there's been Fox News for years, so MSNBC is just a balance for that. And I think if newspapers evolved in the direction of, of, of the British papers, like The Guardian and The Financial Times, which are overtly biased, but still very accurate and fair-minded at some level, that would be, I think that would be very good. Norm? I, I think there are like three phases of this campaign of coverage. I think there was the swoon at the beginning with Obama, but then I think everybody, uh, I remember that Saturday Night Live uh, session on the debate where somebody asked uh, Mr. Senator Obama, I have a question for you. Do you, how do you like your coffee? Uh, <laughs> I, I think the press changed. And you could see that they realized they had to be tougher, and they really started coming after it in a way that uh, was pretty strident. And it wasn't just uh, Fox, it was MSNBC and the like, because they felt that they had to move to that balance. And then I think it got uh, uh, fairly, in my mind, balanced. But I think that at the end of the day, when you're covering candidates, you've got to have somebody who can sell themselves. And I think what really happened is you didn't have a strong Republican candidate that could sell themselves in comparison to Barack Obama. And uh, I think the election proved it. I don't think the, the, the MSNBC or Fox made that big of a difference at that point in time. That's the third effort is that at the end of the day, you started watching the TV and you watched the candidates, whether it was the debate or whether they were being interviewed. And what's the word that kept coming up? He looks presidential. <laughs> Uh, you know, who had the temperament and the uh, 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 attitude to make you feel confident, and you didn't find it in the other candidates. S Sam Reed, uh, give us some facts here. Did the youth turn out or not this year? The youth did turn out. It uh, wasn't quite as great a turnout as we hoped, but uh, what has happened, I think, kind of under the radar screen for a lot of people is we've seen a significant increase from 2000 to 2004, then 2000, between 2002, 2006, and it continued to move up. It wasn't as dramatic as we hoped, but uh, I agree with Patty. I was out in college campuses too, and uh, there were a lot of excitement of young people, and it was true when we went and met with young recruits as well. Uh, so it is great because what we're seeing happening is uh, what you know happened to me when I was was young, where I got just real fired up and excited. First, though I'm a Republican, by John Kennedy, he was he really was inspiring, and then by Dan Evans, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and I saw our whole generation really get engaged, and and I'm sensing that's going to happen with this generation. They've been doing a lot of community service, they like it, and they're beginning to get the connection between community service and what government does. Are you going to ever run for governor? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, you know, I love what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, uh, how many people can say the, the job they're doing, they get up in the morning and say, God, this is great because I'm the historian for the state. We have this great heritage center that we're going to be bringing to the state of Washington. I love elections. Uh, all the reform and, and everything. You, so I, you, I've just got a wonderful job. Seem like I might take on the grief of governor, right? Okay. Yeah, right? You seem like just the kind of mainstream guy this state loves, but, uh -huh. but, but you're not going to do it. Okay, at least not yet. Patty Murray, you know Hillary Clinton. She's your friend. Why did she want to be Secretary of State instead of staying in the Senate and having a real legislative <laughs> record? Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I actually, I saw Hillary last night. She did come for the vote, and I had a chance to talk to her. It's the first time I've had a chance to talk to her personally since uh, she was um, named as the uh, potential Secretary of State. And 
She is, you know, I think uniquely qualified at a very important time to be a visible emissary around the world when we want to change our image around the world and really have people believe that we are a country that looks inward, of course, when we have economic trouble, but we also look outward, and uh, she's got the kind of skills, I think, to, to bring that, and I think she's going to do a great job. She's already talking about uh, a lot of the projects that she wants to get started with the Obama administration, and I think we're going to see some, uh, some really great efforts on her part. How's Ted Kennedy doing? Uh, he was not there this week. He is, as you know, struggling um, with brain cancer. He is in Florida right now uh, getting treatments, and uh, he, it, I've been on the phone with him. He, there is no putting Ted Kennedy down. He is so excited that uh, we're going to have a, a new White House, and he wants to have health care passed. So, you know, he's in the midst of it. Bruce, the prevailing theory so far has been the way to get out of our economic mess is to stabilize the housing market. And yet there now seems to be a sense that, well, no, that doesn't work. We've got we to gotta stabilize the job market, and then that will stabilize the housing market. What's your view? Which is the right one to tackle first um, and, and Unfortunately, most? well, I think we need to do both. And I guess I'm concerned that we haven't quite fixed the housing problem, particularly for people in, on the foreclosure side of things, with, with all due respect to what's going on in the yeah. other Washington. I agree. There isn't really an agreement there. I mean, Sheila Bear is pushing one idea, Treasury is pushing another. So we haven't really solved that problem, but it seems like the job situation is getting worse in a hurry. And I might have said six months ago, well, if we could stabilize housing, then things are going to start coming back. But at this point, I think you've got to do both. Why is, the, why is the housing market still frozen if rates have gone down and, and there is credit available? You guys are lending. All these banks seem to say they still have money to lend. Well, a couple things. One is the rates just went down to five three weeks ago. Um, so, and, and when I talk to people, most of them don't know that. Um, rates are at 5% yeah, at least for ours, a 30 year fix. Ours were yesterday and today, 5%. But most people don't know that. But it's only been three weeks. I think the other thing is there is clearly less, it isn't that there's no mortgages, but there is less availability than there was. And particularly when you get over the Fannie and Freddie and FHA limit, which is around 550 for us, it is, it is tighter uh, there. Although another thing I think we may see, one thing we see in when um, people are thinking about refinancing, you see a lot of people and they're kind of watching rates go down, they watch go down, they watch go down, and it's not until rates go back up that all of a sudden they, they, they want to lock in their rate because they're, you know, they're hoping it's going to go lower and as soon as they have that sense of the opportunity is going away, th then they all call and they just miss the bottom. You know, you may see some of that either in houses or commercial real estate or maybe in the stock market as well. I think. There's a lot of money on the sidelines that I think is waiting to come in at the bottom. And, and chances are most of them will miss it. But once it starts going up, we might be surprised as how quickly it, it turns. Mike, another journalism question. You talked about sort of the elite coverage of this election, the MSNBCs, all the rest. Let me ask you about the, the grassroots coverage and blogging and all the rest. You just started blogging, I think it's fair to say, at the well, Washington Post. I'm not sure you'd ever uh, done it before. Um, well, I've done a little bit. A little bit. Tell us about blogging. Is it? Well, this is the first election where bloggers and the internet in general really were the major factor. People used to have panels like this one about what effect blogging has on the mainstream media. That's no longer an issue because no one cares much about the mainstream media anymore. It's the bloggers themselves. My experience blogging was extre extremely distasteful because, <laughs> you know, people, people will make horrible comments. On, on your blog, and you know, that's, that's the greatness of the internet that they can, but you know, I don't want to read them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I have a First Amendment right not to read them. <laughs> Did bloggers break some of the stories? Um, yes, there was that woman, Mayfield, um, I can't remember her name. She was the Huffington Post? Yes, yeah. yes, who, who caught, she had several scoops over the course of the campaign. And she's, she's, she's not a professional journalist, very ominously. She doesn't get 
paid, and she's just doing this. And she moved the debate. Yes. On, on various different days. Patty Murray, the future of earmarking is what? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I think uh, every White House wants to control the entire budget and doesn't want Congress to control the budget. And every Congress wants to control where the dollars are spent because we are the ones who have to come home and talk to our constituents. So there's always going to be a fight about uh, congressional earmarks. But I think that they do hold an important place because elected officials are the ones who do have to come home and see the um, important projects. I see Joni Earl here, Sound Transit is a critical um, a project, I think, for our region that if you're in Washington, D.C., you may not see it every day when you come home, but here you know all of the issues surrounding it. And by the way, you're held accountable to the electorate for it. Um, the, the opposite is if you are someone who is working hard to get some kind of grant or research dollars, finding your way across the country into a bureaucratic agency at the Department of Defense or Energy is very difficult to do. So uh, a member of Congress, whether it's me or someone else, part of our job is to make sure that our constituents get access to, uh, to uh, funds that are available through the government to do the best thing for us here at home or for the country. So I think you'll always see attention there. Does the viaduct have any chance to get money out of this <laughs> stimulus? Uh, well, uh, I remind you of the shovel-ready <laughs> remark uh, that uh, the president and his team are talking about, and uh, it, it is, they are going to be very clear about stimulus money being uh, shovel-ready so the viaduct won't, be, uh, won't have that money available. Sam Reed, two things. The top two primary, which we implemented this year, seems as though it still has um, its detractors, shall we say. And I have heard from legislators who actually think this early primary, this August primary, is not the be-all, end-all. Helps bureaucratically, but it, boy, it makes campaigning, you know, try campaigning in the middle of August. Um, what's the future of the top two primary, which the parties still hate, and what's the future of the <laughs> August primary? The fact that the Supreme Court decision was seven to two gives me a lot of comfort. <clears throat> uh, yes, the parties are unhappy with it, but uh, we uh, surveyed the public of the state of Washington and, and overall they loved it. And in fact, we also had Stuart Elway do a poll and it was quite overwhelming. Uh, I think they're gonna continue to try to pick, you know, pick, pick, pick and everything, but I, I, I do believe that it is here to stay, as is the earlier primary. Now, we might move it even earlier than that, which, you know, a lot of states do that, and my original proposal was for June. <laughs> Excuse me. But the, <clears throat> but the fact is, is that having that late September primary was very problematical, particularly in a vote-by-mail environment. Uh, we had 19 days between the time we certified the primary, and those ballots had to be in the mail. One of the reasons counties had problems 2004, they're literally throwing together that election. So uh, I do think we need the early primary. And again, it worked out well in terms of the voters. They, they voted, uh, you know, one of the, Turnout the, was the second right. highest rate in the country. So they liked it. Uh, one I, more thing. Well, Norm, did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, as a person who benefited from the late primary <laughs> on several occasions, <laughs> getting into the race late and moving. You were I, like, I you were like notorious <laughs> for filing on the last exactly. day possible. I, I filed for merit on the last day of filing, and thank God I did. But I, I think maybe if it's early June, but I think summer months in the Pacific Northwest trying to campaign and raise money and have a primary is still very difficult. Uh, it probably works by mail, but I still think, I used to say, trying to find uh, uh, someone to attend a fundraiser in the middle of July, if you aren't in the San Juans, <laughs> you can't have one. Uh, it, it really is difficult. Another election question. Uh, this ballot question, you've tried why is it so hard to get the legislature to, to, to pass a law that says ballots have to be in by election day and none of this postmark thing where they're, where they're coming in for the next five days? Well, you just heard this former incumbent say how much they like the way they keep it the way it is. Yeah. And, uh, From campaigning. I didn't say yeah, about right. ballots. But, uh, uh, because the, you know, heck, the system as it exists now is what elected me, you know, so therefore it must be a good system. And that is a lot of it, is just uh, status quo, uh, I, I do think that we're going to make progress on it, but you're right, we've had no success before, but uh, when they see Oregon, who has a vote by, entirely vote by mail, 
All the results are in by Friday afterwards, and we're going on into the next week and later into it. Uh, I, I think that our legislators, hopefully, are going to be a little more receptive this time around. Okay, we're going to do some firing line questions, and then we'll open it up uh, to all of you. I'm going to start with Patty Murray, and we'll come down this way, and we've got about four or five of these. Uh, five words or less is our rough rule here on these answers. What was the most troubling viv visual image for you this year? Oh gosh, I think it was when I was at the Boeing facility with the workers on the floor and it was announced that the tanker deal went to Airbus and not to Boeing. Oh. Bruce Williams. Um, when, I look out my, close. <clears throat> when I look out my window, I see Washington Mutual and the day they got closed and I thought of the people working there. Sam Reed? None occurred to me right off. Washington Mutual and its effect on the city of Seattle uh, from an ownership standpoint, from a uh, job standpoint. Well, it was, it was the pictures from Mumbai, of, of especially the one that all the papers used. Of a, well, anyway. Okay, starting with Mike and going down this way, a little bit more uplifting. What is the most positive visual image for you of the year? I have to pass. Okay, we'll start with Norma, we'll come back to you. Uh, Denver, Colorado. <laughs> Were you there? Were you a delegate? I, I, I wasn't a delegate, but I was there. And Grant Park. <laughs> Those are two of the most yeah. outstanding of the world. <laughs> Sam Reed. Just seeing on, on election day the lines, the great enthusiasm throughout the country, the excitement, uh, I just think that's great. <laughs> He's the one guy that loves the lines. <laughs> <laughs> the election administrator. Yeah, okay, right. Bruce Williams, positive uh, I, image of the year. I, I have a 13-year-old daughter who speaks Spanish well, and being in Mexico and watching her talk to Mexicans was just great. Patty Murray. Being up at Wild Sky when we designated as a wilderness after a long eight-year mm. battle. <laughs> Mike, All we're right. back to you for Time positive image. It was, um, it was Hillary Clinton and Obama standing together when he announced her as Secretary of State. The person or leader who most inspired you this year, why don't we start with Sam and go down that way and then wrap around. Well, what is interesting, it's one I mentioned earlier inspiring, it's Dan Evans. I went to him regarding the Heritage Center. He's in his 80s. He doesn't need to do this kind of stuff. Stepped up, chaired the committee, out there talking to people, calling him. I mean, that's the kind of civic engagement I know City Club cares about and is inspiring to all of us. For me, it'd be my dad and my grandfather who led our company during the Great Depression and the Boeing bust, and I, I think about them. I think for me it would be a woman whose name is Cynthia Lefevre, whose son was injured in Iraq with a traumatic brain injury uh, about five years ago now, who has stood by him every step of the way as he has worked his way through a very challenging medical situation, uh, and she is completely responsible for his entire waking day, and yet she is back at Walter Reed on a regular basis to fight for all the other vets who are going through the same thing. Mike. Well, it's Barack Obama. <laughs> it's a cliche, but it's true. Norm? <laughs> it's Barack Obama. And, uh, but uh, it goes a little more than that. Uh, I, I still think that one of the hardest things in the world for a uh, leader to do is to listen. And his ability to listen and respond rather than pontificate uh, inspires me. Okay, Bruce, next question. What was the key focus of your efforts from a professional standpoint this year? And remember, we're, we're roughly five words. Economics change. Lots of change, good and bad. Professional efforts this year, Patty Murray. Oh, there's, there's been so many. I, I would just say probably the most personal and passionate that I feel about fighting for the veterans to make sure they get the services and particularly worried about the suicide rates that continue to climb. Mike, what's been your biggest professional emphasis this year? Well, it's the same every year, meeting deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> it's your book. We should just let, let you say ten words about this book, Creative uh, Capitalism. How'd it come about? Thank you. It's based on a little bit closer to the microphone. It's mic based on a speech that Bill Gates gave at Davos, and it's it's a variety of people communicating by email about how 
capitalism can address some of the serious problems that are too big even for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> Norm Wright's professional efforts this year. Working to create a, a civic engagement uh, course and construct to teach people how to rally communities to work collectively and collaboratively around critical issues. Sam Reed. Uh, engendering the trust and confidence of the electorate in our system after it was so shaken by the 2004 gubernatorial recount and going back to what happened in Florida. Okay, now we'll just come back down the line the key focus of your efforts this year on a personal level, oh, Patty Murray. That's hard to separate. Uh, obviously, veterans, I think, again, and getting my daughter married. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, she got herself married. Yeah. I just had to just <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> It was not arranged. <laughs> no. Okay, Bruce Williams. Um, just, you know, focusing on what's really important, and that's my family. Sam Reed, per personal efforts this year. Uh, well, actually, it ties into professional, and that is, is seeing the Heritage Center move forward to be constructed on the Capitol campus. Norm? Taking care of my two-year-old grandson on uh, Mondays, I babysit, and watching him grow and hoping that I can impart uh, some good values to it. <laughs> That's great, Mike. I'm keeping my personal business personal. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, church and state there. Yeah. Uh, one more question, then we open it up. What's the greatest threat facing the United States today, Mike Kinsley? Um, well, uh, it's, it's another explosion. Is it terrorism? Sort. No, it's the economy. I think, you know, uh, Bush and his supporters brag that, in, that we've had seven years with no repeat of 9-11. We had seven years before 9-11, which were okay too. I think the, the economy is a much worse danger. Pa uh, patience. Uh, people have to understand this cannot be fixed in the way that most Americans' mentality look at things. This is gonna take a lot of patience, and I hope that people can understand that. That mindset's a big threat if yes. we don't change it. Sam Reed? Or impatience, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> uh, making sure the solution isn't worse than the problem. Uh, I see this with state government, now that we have another huge revenue shortfall. Uh, I don't want short-range decisions to be so destructive that it hurts the mission of state government. I see that true nationally as well. Bruce, biggest threat? Um, I think the biggest threat the Senator mentioned and FDR mentioned before her is fear itself. Patty Murray? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with that, fear itself. And it is the economy, and it's the fact that it's not just us. It's a global economy, and trying to do the right thing, and nobody really has the perfect answer, and we're all trying to figure it out and know it's going to take some time. Who wants to jump in here? And while we get people lined up quickly, what is the future of the auto bailout? Well, it's now in the White House's hands. Will they do it? Uh, we don't know. The White House um, originally uh, opposed the auto bailout because they did not want the money to come from TARP. Uh, bec uh, but because they opposed that, we tried to take it out of another fund. That failed last night. And the only way that can, they can be helped immediately now is to take it out of TARP. So we'll see. Do you expect they will? I, I honestly don't know. Yes. Did you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, they indicted a lot of hands as soon as the first was heard. Can you comment on the issue of the Okay, let me just repeat it quickly for the TV audience. Who's the next Secretary of Transportation? What is the future of highway funds and... Will the transportation bill be renewed? Well, she's talking about the um, transportation authorization bill, which supposedly is done every six years. It took us about eight or nine last time, which defines the projects that will be funded over the next yeah. six to eight years. The problem is it's the highway trust fund, like everything else, is out of money. 
And we are going to have to make a determination how we are going to fund our transportation projects at a time when people are very concerned about the economy. So there isn't any really easy decisions in front of us. Uh, but the immediate thing we'll be working on is the stimulus, and there is a, a major impact on that in ter terms of transportation infrastructure. I don't know who the, uh, the new administration will choose as transportation secretary, but based on what I have seen them do so far with their uh, cabinet nominees, it will be somebody that is future oriented, that is willing to bring some incredible uh, experience to help us solve the problems we face. Yes, next. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for joining this conversation. It's really wonderful. I think you're each a, an incredible example of the kind of civic engagement that City Club does. My question is, it felt like after the election that we had the world's attention again, not unlike post 9-11 where we, we had an outpouring of goodwill and interest and we have an opportunity um, that we don't want to have squandered is the only word I can think of it. How do we sort of, how do we react to have a different sort of outcome of this attention we have from the world? How do we capitalize on this moment of goodwill for this country? Who wants to jump in? Well, I, I mentioned it earlier. Every one of us has to see that there's a place for us to do something. National service. I really believe national service for uh, those young people, especially around the fields of health, education, and I think uh, our environment. I think there are good programs that be, could be put to uh, uh, work uh, for individuals moving in that direction. The, then the second thing is the rehabilitation and the investment in the infrastructure. I was kidding with Michael saying the stimulus package is an earmark. <laughs> And it ought to be, it should be earmarked for across this nation where people can see where those investments are taking uh, place because that builds confidence. And I think then uh, you, you have a kind of activity that's going on that really can make a difference. And, and, I, and I'm thinking sort of our place in the global community as well. I, I think well, I think that's, oh, I'm yeah. part, the, 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 that's where I think the yeah. other part of service is like right. the Peace Corps or renewing. Right. Uh, that kind of engagement. I think more people want to be involved to do that. I think there is a lot in the globe that we need to pay attention to and be a part of from poverty to water problems to global health issues uh, that if we are a partner with those uh, countries in helping solve them, it not only will help the economy of the world, but it will help the stability of the world. Secretary Gates himself has said that there should be a a third D in the national security strategy, defense diplomacy, and he calls it development. And I, I agree with that and think that if we take this opportunity that we now have to work with um, countries to help raise the level for them, that it will do us good in the long run. Mike, is it, an, is it enough just to have a new president? Well, that's certainly a start. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think part of what of the agenda of the new administration has to be essentially undoing the agenda of the old one, it, especially in terms of its impact around the world. Dismantling Guantanamo, rethinking the notion of preemptive war, uh, making less arrogant assertions about um, habeas corpus and, and the First Amendment. That sort of thing will will restore our our image around the world. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Stephanie Mapelli from Leadership East Side. I'd also like to echo Betty's thanks to you for being here today. I believe that collaboration is going to be a key component on a national basis as well as a local basis to help us get out of this mess. What's your one thing? What's the one idea that we all maybe could walk out of here with that would help us to know, hey, I never thought about that. How could we foster greater collaboration? Bruce? I, I'm not sure to exactly answer your, <clears throat> your question, but it, it seems to me as a region, I mean, we, we, we need a national stimulus package, but as a region, we have to think about how we're going to collaborate to do the best we can in our region, and that means collaborating on our assets, which include environmental quality, education, the Senator mentioned, in terms of um, alternative energy. And 
you know, traditionally, for example, environmentalists and the business community have fought with each other. I think we're getting better at that, but I think we need to collaborate on the regional assets we have to make our region as, as good as we can. Can I add to that? I, you know, I think we're at one of those times in our nation's history where we're really in trouble. And the places that will come out of this the best are the, places, are the communities that know where they want to be at the end of it. And if we define that for our region now, what do we want at the end of the day? Is it a green economy? Is it to be part of the global health? Uh, I mean, what, what do we want our economy based on? And then we look to everyone to be a part of reaching that goal from public, private, local, uh, all levels of government, as well as uh, all businesses and, and agencies. And we all you know, put our shoulders to the wheel and make that happen, we will come out of this a lot stronger at the end. And it will take collaboration and everybody working together. I, I really believe that, uh, Tim O'Neill said all politics is local. Uh, whatever the investment is going to be made in the areas that need to be made, there has to be a civic engagement or involvement of our citizens in helping to build that. It, if it's just top down, I think some people will be left out. They have to see that this administration and the governments that are going to implement the stimulus package have heard them and know what they need rather than what they think they need. And until we can develop a engagement or a process where people can lay out the value propositions that they believe in and then see those dollars then begin to meet their aspirations, uh, we'll have problems. I think you can do it. It takes a lot of work. It is, uh, I think, the biggest challenge for the uh, Obama administration is going to be trying to get shovels and picks out there quickly it, and not ignore it or ignoring what people want. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got to come together and they've got to spend some time making sure that they're in sync. Sam, <clears throat> One thing that really undermines collaboration in the political system <clears throat> is the sharp kind of, of partisan politics that is being played so often in this country in our various legislative bodies. <clears throat> It's being exacerbated by these blogs, by the talk radio and all that. And I think what we really need from people like you and people the City Club is for the big center to speak up a little more in terms of saying, hey, it's time to rise among above partisan differences and not be there to try to make the other guys look bad, but to really get things done in a positive way. And uh, I'm just hoping that out of this crisis we're going to be engendering that kind of more, you know, cooperation, and, I, and I'm impressed with what President-elect Obama is saying about that, that, he, that how much he wants to do that, and uh, I, I think this is time to take advantage of the situation to tone down the partisan rhetoric. Bruce? So I could just say, I think that's why you're in a Republican country who got elected in a very democratic year. It's exactly that attitude. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just follow up quickly with Mike on that, this, this sort of sense that blogging might be debasing the culture. Is blogging helping or hurting political life? Um, well, I mean, It's um, breaking stories, but is it helping or hurting? I think it's helping overall. Because it, yeah, A.J. Liebling said very famously, famous press critic of the mid 20th century, freedom of the press is for those who own one. <laughs> and, you know, it used to be that only two people in Seattle owned one. Now everybody owns one, and that's an advance for democracy. And it does make cooperation maybe a little more difficult. But, you know, there's something to be said for partisan differences, too. Yes. Hi, Catherine McConnell with Goodwill. I'd like to ask uh, Senator Murray uh, when we might expect a discussion about the bailout of education, perhaps. Uh, this state is the community colleges are facing huge budget cuts in the University of Washington. Maybe even Norm Rice's program is going to get cut. Uh, when will that discussion go beyond the picks and shovels today to th that end picture, where we want to be, and, and where is that money going to come from? Thank you. I, I really share your concern, and it is deeply 
I should be, think it should be deeply disconcerting to all of us when we hear about 20% cuts to education today. Right when people are losing jobs and they don't have the opportunity to get back and get a skill for where we are going tomorrow. Right when we have an administration coming in who says they want to do critical investments in infrastructure to move us to a green economy or to a different healthcare system. Unless education is part of that and training those workers for that, um, that those new economies will never be successful. So it is right now that we need, need, do need to be educating people. I've been actually focused really on our high schools for some time because our dropout rates are so astounding. When uh, you know 66% of our kids uh, graduate, and it's even lower for minorities. For some minorities, it's only 50% of them graduate in time. Those people are all out on the street, and there is no jobs for them today. And you know we see the results uh, in the news. Um, we should be looking at our high schools and not saying, how do we make sure you pass uh, a graduation, but how do we make sure you are getting the skills you need to go into a career and the education for that career as you move through high school. Uh, sort of a pathway to a good career for every student is sort of my goal. Um, and for some kids it is a four-year university or beyond. For some it's apprenticeship programs. For some it's community colleges. Uh, but those kids need to see a pathway to their success or we'll continue to lose them and our economy will struggle for a very long time. Yes. Jennifer Geltrop from the Seattle Public Library and kind of following up on some of these comments about education, we are seeing today more and more people come through our doors looking to get onto computers. They aren't blogging because they don't have computers at home. They might be blogging at the library, but they're coming in for job skills. They're coming in to learn English as a second language and we are partners in the educational process too. And so this is for the whole room, things that you're seeing that you think the library can do and libraries throughout the country are trying to outreach and serve the community and especially the underserved in these times so thank you for the support yeah I, I really do believe that the linkage between uh, some of our community centers libraries uh, community colleges uh, have to be more uh, 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 seamless and, and and readily available what happens right now is we we, we take components and we don't look at the continuum of where people move and where that access is. As you develop communities, as you build neighborhoods, as you build transit, those kinds of things have to be around centers so that people can get to those places quickly and they can then uh, move. And we have an education system, a community college system, a library system that doesn't tie in as easily. And until they begin to tie in, until we rebuild those kinds of things, it's gonna be hard to start to get the coordination that you need. So when, when I talk about the stimulus package and all the other kinds of things, those are the kinds of investment people have to see that it's building a community, it's giving you an opportunity, and you can see a pathway for yourself and your family as those investments are made. You do that, you have a legacy that'll last for a lifetime. We have to close down, but I've got three rapid fire questions <laughs> that we have promised we will ask. I'm gonna start with Mike and go down. You are all leaders. And we're interested to know who inspires you. You've said Barack Obama, and if you've said him already, no fair. Okay. Give us the name of one or two people who inspire you. Well, this group down here is pretty inspiring. <laughs> Norm. Uh, my mother and Nelson Mandela. <laughs> yeah. Sam Reeves. The late Joel Pritchard and late Jim Dolliver. I mentioned my dad and grandfather before. I would also add Barack Obama in a in a hopeful way, man, hoping he's going to be as good as you know we we need him to be. Patty Murray. I, I see so many people every day that inspire me, but I I would have to say in this year, just the American public turning out and saying we want our government to work for us. Okay, what are you most hopeful about this past year? Uh, the pa or looking forward. Can we look forward? Because I'm. <laughs> what are you most <laughs> Fair enough. What are you most hopeful about? I am most hopeful that we will have a country that sit, doesn't just say I voted on election day, but that I'm going to be involved in making this country work for a lifetime. Bruce. Th that will turn the economy around in a way that makes us a better country. Sam. I hope the excitement and the inspiration that's provided by Barack Obama really 
catches on nationally and, and carries forward. As I said, I remember Kennedy and, and when Evans came in, and I, I just hope to see that dynamic occur uh, over this next couple of years. Norm Rice. I echo the same thing Senator Murray says, that everybody has to do something to make it work. We can't wait for somebody to do it for ourselves. And Thank I you. hope that no more newspapers go bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the final question, we're gonna start with Patty Murray. Give us your best provocative prediction for 2009. Uh, boy, that, um, okay. Uh, I, I, w I guess I hope that a year from now we're sitting in this room and uh, people are feeling hope instead of fear. Prediction Bruce Williams. The optimist me would say things may turn around quicker than we hope, than we, than we expect. Sam Reed. <clears throat> the same. I think by middle part of next year, I think the credit is going to open up and we're going to see you know, refinancing and people taking out mortgages, and I'm hoping that's going to really start charging up our economy. 2009 prediction, Norm Rice. Uh, our candidates will be campaigning on the idea of aspirations and hope and not fear and division. Mike Kinsley. Unlike Bill Clinton's first year, um, Democrats won't turn against their own and Republicans <laughs> will be more cooperative and, and maybe the honeymoon will last longer than a week. Give them a hand, <laughs> they were great.